Mother's Day, while Christmas Eve was called by them Mother Night. See, we just inherited these things. I grew up loving Christmas. It wasn't until I became an adult that I found out or realized after reading the Word of God and reading history that it's pagan. And it has nothing to do with Jesus. So why would somebody put a veneer of Jesus on it and have me worshiping something that you could trace all the way back to Babylon? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, has done this. This is the next one, Lent, because this time, this weeping for the Tammuz, is associated with Lent. This is from Sabian Researchers. It says, quote, a 40-day abstinence period was anciently observed in honor of the pagan gods Osiris, Adonis, and Tammuz. You cannot find in the Bible where it's telling you to observe Lent. That's not in the Bible. You can't find in the Bible that it's telling you to observe Lent, nor can you find in the Bible that you're supposed to deal with Easter. You think about even what Easter is. Easter, what, what do you have eggs and bunnies for? Because it's associated with fertility. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus didn't die on Good Friday and rise Easter Sunday. That's not in the Bible. That's not, I know people, people have a like, what do you mean? That's not in the Bible. He was in the grave for three days and three nights, according to Matthew 12. You can't get three days and three nights out of Good Friday, Easter Sunday. We're going to read that. But now, we read about this Lent, right? Let's go, uh, let's go to 1 Timothy. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4. And I'll read this from John Cassian. It's, it's a Lent Library of Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers of the Christian Church, 2nd Series, Volume 11. It says, quote, it ought to be known that the observance of Lent did not exist as long as the primitive church retained its perfection unbroken. That's a very eloquent way of saying, listen, they weren't keeping Lent. So where do you think, why did they get, where did they get Lent from and associating that with Christ? They got Lent from what was being done and had been done by pagans. They got Lent from that time when they were weeping for Tammuz. So people are engaged in the same practices that they were engaged in, even going all the way back to Babylon, under different names. You need to challenge your worship and see what you're engaged in. Now we're in 1 Timothy. Yeah, 1 Timothy 4, and let's pick it up at verse 1. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Because, and we're going to have to give an account for what we do. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Let's pick it up there. When you're ready, brother, go ahead. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So Paul in his epistle, this first epistle to Timothy, is telling him about this dark time that's coming. He says, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall do what? Depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines or teachings of devils. See, we're talking about this going back to Babylon and this amongst men, but who is influencing these men to do this? This is satanic. What are they doing? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And what else are they doing? Forbidding to marry and, and commanding to abstain from meat. Now stop for a second. It says forbidding to marry. Now, we understand that the Lord established the institution of marriage, which has been destroyed today. But he established the institution of marriage between a man and a woman. Why? For the ultimate purposes of procreation, to pro procreate a godly seed, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's what he said. But you have some that were forbid to marry. Who is teaching to forbid from marriage? That is Catholic doctrine. They do not allow their priests to be married, and that's why they have so many instances of mother, well, partially why you see so many instances of molestation. It says forbidding to marry and doing what? And commanding to abstain from meats. What is that talking about? That's talking about Lent. But that's a doctrine of devils. The Bible never told you, the priest, not to get married. He never told you the command to abstain from meats. And then you got some false, some false ministers who will come in and say, well, that means you can eat anything. Contextually, that's not even what he's talking about. 
It said, forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the what? True. The truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Then he says something. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So the word of God sanctifies what you can and cannot eat and what, who knows, in what chapter of the Bible? What book? Leviticus. Leviticus. Thank you, brother. Leviticus, the 11th chapter. Very good. So now, let's go to uh, this next reference about Easter and where this came from. This is from Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words. Article, uh, is, the article name is Easter, page 192. It says, quote, the term Easter is not of Christian origin. Even when you find in the Bible, it is mentioned one time the word Easter, and you go to the Greek, and the word there is Pascha, which means Passover. Never, and they are not synonymous. But nevertheless, it says the term Easter is not of Christian origin. It is another form of a star tape. One of the titles of the Chaldean goddess and the what? The queen of heaven. See, people doing the same things under different names. The festival of Pasch, or Passover, and the Feast of Olympus was a continuation of the Jewish, that is God's feast. From this, Pasch, the pagan festival of Easter, was quite distinct, meaning they're different, and was introduced into the what? Apostate Western religion. Apostasy. That's how you got Easter into Christianity. It said that part of an attempt to adapt pagan festivals to Christianity. So what the Catholic Church did, ultimately, they saw what the, what the pagans were doing, and they adopted all their customs, all their festivals, all their traditions, and just stamped the name of Jesus and others on it. Oh, you dealing with this, the winter solstice on December 25th? Stamp Jesus' birthday. Oh, you dealing with Ishtar and these pagan fertility goddess? We're going to deal with Easter. You got a queen of heaven? Well, you know Mary's the queen of heaven. Over and over and over again. Even when you look at Halloween, look at the history of Halloween, and you can go back to and see that the Catholics co-opted a festival called Sowing to the Dead that you found in Celtic countries. Over and over and over again, you see this. Now, let's go to uh, let's go to Matthew the 28th or the 12th chapter. Matthew the 12th chapter. Just going back to Babylon. This is under Zonovan under Ishtar. It says her name is spelled in various ways. Ishtar, Astarte, Astartu in the Armon of letters. Ishtar in Babylonia. The name and code of the goddess was derived from Babylonia, where she was the goddess of love and war. The chief seat of her worship in Babylon was Iraq. So again, just pointing that out one more time. Easter, that's where that comes from. Now, just to prove, let's go to Matthew the 12th chapter. Because that's hard for people to wrap their heads around. I grew up, man, I grew up with my cheap Easter suit and my Payless shoes, and I had memorized my speech every Easter. You don't want to be up there with the paper. You had to, you had to memorize it. You had to memorize it. I was getting, my stomach was hurting from eating Easter, Easter, uh, Easter bunnies made out of chocolate. They used to give you an Easter basket. I don't know if the people still do this. They give you an Easter uh, chocolate bunny about this big, and you sit there and try to eat the whole thing. I dyed Easter eggs. Hundreds of them. But uh, that was all pagan. That was some paganism. I, I grew up thinking he died on Good Friday and rose Easter Sunday, like everybody else. The problem, though, is that that is not biblical. Matthew 12 and verse 38. When you ready, brother, go ahead. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. He said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. We want to know if you the Messiah. We want a sign. Verse 39, what did he tell them? But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Mm -hmm. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So he said, no sign shall be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. What does he tell him? For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So the sign that he gave them that he was the Messiah was that just as Jonah was in the whale's belly, Wells belly for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, or the grave for three days and three nights. You cannot get three days and three nights 
from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. I'm not a mathematician, but that's not three days and three nights. Let's read one other place on this. We're going to take a short detour, Matthew 28, and find out, excuse me, 26, Matthew 26, and find out what day he died. Matthew, and he tells you, Matthew 26, Matthew 26, and let's pick it up at verse 1. Matthew 26 and verse 1. When you ready, brother, go ahead. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these things, uh -huh. he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. It is fitting that he died on the Passover. What is the Passover? That's the... That's the feast of the Lord in which, what did they do? They, they took a lamb on the 10th day of the first month of being. They took it and they kept it until the 14th day. And on the 14th day of even, they killed the lamb, took the blood, and put the, put the blood on the side post and the door post. And they had to come up under the blood to do what? To escape the wrath of the destroying angel of God. That was in Egypt. That's symbolic of Christ. That tempt keeping of keeping it from the 10th day to the 14th day represents the trial period to ensure that this lamb was perfect. See, that lamb pointed to none other than the true lamb of God. That's why when John the Baptist said, saw him, he said, behold, the lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. And we must come up under the blood of Christ in order to escape the wrath of God. That's what the Passover points to. And it is fitting that Jesus came and died exactly on that day. Because he, as Paul tells us, he is our Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us. But now, let's, let's look at this universal sun worship. This is from the Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. He says, the adoration of the sun was one of the earliest and most natural forms of religious expression. Complex modern theologies are merely involvements and amplifications of this simple aboriginal belief. To them, aboriginal peoples, he, the sun, was the innate fire of bodies, the fire of nature, author of life, heat, and ignition. See, so what man did all over the man, I say man, I mean mankind, all over the world, they all experienced the power of the sun and worshiped the sun. The problem was you're supposed to worship the sun who put the, the one who put the sun out there, not the sun. The sun is not eternal. The sun, has, the scientists will tell you, has a death date. But nevertheless, he was to them the efficient cause of all generation, for without him there was no movement, no existence, no form. He was to them immense, indivisible, imperishable, and everywhere present. It was their need of life, of his creative energy, that was felt by all men, and nothing was more fearful to them than his absence. His beneficent influences caused his identification with the principle of good, and the Brahma of the Hindus, and the Mithra of the Persians, and the Atham, it says, Amun, Patha, and Osiris of the Egyptians, the Baal of the Chaldeans, the Adonai of the Phoenicians, the Adonis and Apollo of the Greeks became but personifications of the sun, the regenerating principle, image of fecundity, which perpetrates, or excuse me, perpetuates and rejuvenates the world's existence. But what name are they using today? They have used the name of Jesus. Nothing wrong with Jesus, but they have created another Jesus that was born on December 25th in honor of what? The Son. See, they just, they were already doing it. So they said, oh, well, you're just doing it under the name of Jesus today. Even when you look at Sunday, <laughs> Sunday, you can't find weekly Sunday worship in the Bible. Sunday was the day of what? The sun. So that's why they used that day. So people, unbeknownst to them, and they carry a Bible. See, one thing about it, you carry a Bible to church, you go to church. Where you going? I'm going to the Bible. Going to church. I got my Bible. Blow the dust off of it because it has not been read. Because if it was read, you'd be like, wait a minute, why are we going? To, why are we here on Sunday when it say the Sabbath day? Well, pastor said it. Well, can you have pastor read that to me? So he might try to, he might try to finagle. He know you ignorant. So he gonna tell you a lie. As long as you keep paying those tithes, keep that money rolling, it's all good. But it's not all good. 
So here you see the current pope, and he has the Eucharist here, the monstrous, the sunburst. Why? You have to think about this. Why? And you see the same imagery in Babylon. Why do you have a sunburst? What does this have to do with Jesus? It had nothing to do with Jesus. This is not about Jesus. This is not about the Bible. This is the perpetuation of the mystery spiritual Babylonian system. Here we have more sun worship. This is an obelisk. This is from Masonic and Co symbols, page 341. An obelisk means bell shaft. This is the male member or the male uh, private part that is the, the principle that is life. We can understand that. Why do you have this bell shaft in Vatican City, it's St. Peter's facility? Why? Because it's the same type of worship. And here what do you have? The sunset of the vernal equinox, sunrise of the vernal equinox, the summer solstice, winter solstice. These are regenerative principles that they hear. It's all in your face. But people, we're not really, we're not really reading the word of God to see what we're doing. Um, this, this is, uh, oh, yeah, we almost finished, the uh, Development of Christian Doctrine, essay on the development of Christian doctrine by uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, page 359, quote, the use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints and ornamented, ornamented on occasions with branches of trees, incense, lamps, and candles, bottom offerings on recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holidays, Christmas, Easter, and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, such as those.